So the reading quiz, the first question says, which is not an accusation that the narrator makes against Gilroy? A, Gilroy was too cheap to pay someone to care for his plant. B, Gilroy took advantage of the narrator's kindness. C, Gilroy fooled the narrator about the difficulty of the task. And D, Gilroy chose the wrong person for the job. So the narrator gives many different excuses as to why he wasn't able to water the, uh, the plant. And so A, Gilray was too cheap to pay someone to care for the plant was not one of those excuses. Number two, what is the narrator implying in the following part of the text? Gilray had owned his flower pot for several months, during which time I take him at his word, he had watered it daily. So I said I would come back to this point earlier in my lecture. And at this point, I'd really like to point out the part where it says, I take him at his word. And like I said, this kind of implies or foreshadows that perhaps Gilray did not have a chrysanthemum in the first place, or perhaps that the plant was already dead. The options here is he's implying that Gilray never even really had a plant. He's implying that Gilray could be lying. He's implying that Gilray doesn't have a social life, or he's implying that Gilray is inexperienced. And here, I think that he's implying Gilray could have been lying. Gilray um, could have been lying. All right, let's look at question number three. Why does the narrator disbelieve that Gilray got the plant as a gift? A, he believes that Gilray traded his watch for it. B, he argues that ladies find Gilray undesirable. C, he accuses Gilroy of stealing it from a garden, and D, he claims that Gilroy got boots and a gown instead. Well, it doesn't actually suggest that Gilroy traded his watch for it. If you remember back to the first part of the text, he says that, Gilroy says, Gilroy says that watering a plant is as easy to remember as winding your watch. But B, he does give that little jab to Gilray near the end of the text where it says, but Gilray was not my sweetheart, nor I feel certain any other person's. And that definitely seems like it might be the best answer here. Uh, the narrator doesn't believe that Gilray would ever get a plant. He never suggests or accuses Gilray of stealing the plant from a garden. And while he does suggest that Gilray perhaps traded it, that's not really what the question is asking. So here, B is going to be the best choice. Number four, which is not one of the excuses that the narrator uses to defend his actions? He was denied access to Gilray's room. Well, I don't know if he ever says that because he was allowed access. There was that one time where he met with the housekeeper on the steps, but later on, John Williams was able to let the narrator into Gilray's house. B, he was too tired after work. No, he definitely uses that this as one of his excuses. When I reached home, I was tired. C, he was not allowed to bring the plant to his house. And while that might be the case, um, I don't think that might be the best answer. And D, he was too busy reading and entertaining his friends, uh, which was definitely one of the excuses that he was given, that he had given. So here, um, he did not use the fact that he was denied access to Gilray's house as an excuse as to why he didn't water the plants. Number five, which best explains why the narrator mentions Gilray's smoking habits in the first paragraph? So let's reread that section real quick. It says, I charge Gilray's unreasonableness to his ignoble passions for cigarettes. Ignoble, unnoble, not worthy. So he is concerned for Gilray's well-being. Never in the text does it suggest that. B, he's informing the reader of pertinent information. Is it that important? I don't know. I don't think so. C, he's trying to raise awareness of health issues. And D, he is defaming Gilray. Here, calling him ignoble is a way of defaming or lessening the credibility of his friend Gilray. He's saying that Gilray was unreasonable because of his passion for nicotine or for cigarettes. Number six, 
which best describes the narrator's reaction to receiving reminder letters from Gilray? Well, I'm sure you remember this part of the text. He starts to get these uh, persistent and consistent letters where Gilray is not ob objectively or obviously asking about the plant, but rather in hindsight or retrospect or in postscript, kind of just you know, sprinkling in the idea that he should be watering the plant, suggesting that the plant needs to be watered and wondering about the plant itself. Later on, Gilray starts to send postcards, which really starts to haunt and disrupt the narrator's uh, sense of peace. And so my guess, without having read the questions, is that the narrator's reaction to receiving the reminder letters from Gilray is that he was, um, he was bothered by it. Um, so let's see if any of the answers uh, correlate with that. The narrator receives a reminder just in time to save the plant. Matt, no. The narrator is thankful for the reminders but does not act on them. No, he is not thankful for the reminders. C, the narrator is offended that Gilray would doubt him, perhaps. And D, the narrator appreciate, appreciates Gilray's concern but ignores the reminders. So here the best choice is going to be C. He was offended that Gilray would suggest that he wouldn't water the plants, even though he didn't water the plants, that is. Number seven, with which statement would the narrator most likely disagree? So with which statement would the narrator most likely disagree? A, Gilroy expected unreasonable things from the narrator. No, I think the narrator would agree with that. B, Gilroy's right to turn his home into a garden is questionable. Uh, maybe? Gilroy shares very little blame in what happens. There, the narrator would probably agree. Um, the narrator's trying to put the blame on everyone else, including Gilroy, and so... The narrator would probably disagree with the statement that Gilray shares very little blame in what happened because he believes that Gilray should share much blame. Or D, Gilray set the narrator up to fail. While the narrator implies or perhaps suggests that when he says, I take him at his word, that's never, uh, never fully developed. And so here, the best choice is going to be C. Number eight. Which technique is used in the following sentence? With the servants flinging out the flower pots faster than I could water them, what more could I have done? Is it A, a simile? Well, simile is comparing two things using like or as, and I don't see the words like or as in that passage. B, a metaphor is again comparing two things but without using like or as, and here it doesn't really seem like anything's being compared. C, personification is when you give human-like attributes or qualities to inanimate objects. And here, it doesn't seem like the narrator is trying to be poetic in that way. And D, hyperbole or speaking hyperbolically is when you say an over-exaggerated statement that wasn't intended to be taken literally. For example, you might say something like, there were like a million fire trucks at the fire the other day. Well, there probably weren't a million fire trucks, but you're trying to get across the point that there were a lot of fire trucks. And here, I think that's what the narrator's trying to also do. He's saying that the, the servants were flinging out flower pots left and right faster than he could water them. And while there's only one flower pot, it already starts to suggest that the narrator's being hyperbolic or exaggerating the occasion. Also, the servants weren't flinging them out faster than he could water them. The narrator's just procrastinating on the fact that he was supposed to water one chrysanthemum. And so here, this just is not a true statement. It's uh, being used to show that the narrator felt frazzled or perhaps overwhelmed and is trying to get that point across. Um, and he's just being exaggerative. Number nine, which conclusion is best supported by the text? The narrator convincingly proves that Gilray is at fault. The narrator acknowledges his faults and wants to make amends. The narrator accepts little to no responsibility for what happened. And the narrator accepts his fair share of the responsibility. So the narrator uh, does not convincingly prove that Gilray was at fault. Although he suggests it, I don't think he proves it convincingly. The narrator acknowledges his faults and wants to make amends? No, no. 
he uh, basically says it wasn't his fault, or if it was his fault, it was barely his fault. And then later on, he will never do anything for Gilray like that again. The narrator accepts little to no responsibility for what happened. That does seem to be the case. As I noted, the narrator made approximately 13 excuses as to why he did not water the plant. And then later, the narrator accepts his fair share of the responsibility, which is not the case. And then finally, number 10. Which technique is used in the following sentence? I would never do Gilroy a, fi Gilray a favor again. Is it A, it's silly to lose a friend over a plant? B, the narrator perceives his failure as a favor? C, Gilray was doing the narrator a favor the whole time? Or D, they were both taking care of the same plant? Which technique is used in the following sentence? I would never do Gilray a favor again. I'm not entirely sure what this question is asking, but it seems like B is the best choice. The narrator perceives his failure as a favor. The fact that he didn't water the plants suggests that that's maybe what Gilray had wanted all along. The narrator perceives his failure as a favor. Even though the narrator failed, he was still trying to do this favor for Gilray. Let's look at this last question. What is ironic or humorous about the following sentence? Gilray kept pestering me with letters about his chrysanthemum. He seemed to have no faith in me, a detestable thing in a man who calls himself your friend. The question is asking what's ironic about this statement, and there are three types of irony. There's situational, verbal, and dramatic. Situational irony is when you expect one thing to happen, but the opposite thing happens. So for example, a fire station burning down or a police station getting robbed. Those are good examples of situational irony. Verbal irony is in the family of sarcasm. It's very close. Uh, when somebody's being verbally ironic, they're saying one thing, but meaning the other. So for example, uh, I, as I have several times throughout this video, if I stuttered over a sentence or over my words and someone said, oh, Mr. Holm, you're so poetic and great with words, and they actually meant the opposite, that's being verbally ironic. Another example would be if I walked into a room and spilled my books everywhere and somebody said, oh, wow, you're so graceful. They're being sarcastic. It's not true. I'm a clump. I'm a klutz. I'm being clumsy. And then the last form of irony is uh, kind of hard to understand. It's called dramatic irony. And dramatic irony is when the audience knows something that the characters in the stories do not. So my example that I always use is uh, imagine like a horror movie where the audience knows that the scary clown is hiding in the closet with a knife waiting to kill whoever opens the closet. And then there's that character, uh, that person walking down the hall about to go take a shower and wanting to go get a towel from the closet. And as they near the closet, the audience like, don't go in there. But they're like, la di da I have no idea. There's a scary clown about to kill me. The audience knows. The character doesn't. The character opens up the door and boom, they're stabbed, right? So that's an example of dramatic irony. So again, what is ironic or humorous about the following sentence? Gilray kept pestering me with letters about his chrysanthemum. He seemed to have no faith in me, a detestable thing in a man who calls himself your friend. Why don't you write the answer in the comment section down below? Also in the comment section down below, do you think that Gilray's plant was already dead? Or do you think that Gilray chose the narrator because he knew the narrator wouldn't water the plant and could therefore be blamed for the dead chrysanthemum later on upon his return? Also in the comment section below, if you want lessons on specific aspects of ELA that you can't find elsewhere online like YouTube or Google, let me know and I will uh, perhaps make a video for that. So that's all I have for today. Um, in the future, depending on what kind of time and inspiration that I have, um, I may continue to go through these packets um, or I may create some supplemental um, information and lessons 
Um, but for the time being, make sure that you're reading your free choice novels. Make sure that you are practicing your vocabulary, working on your comprehension skills on Lexia Power Up Reading Plus, and um, you know, getting creative. Get creative. Do that creative writing activity, and perhaps I'll do the same. So I hope you're all doing well and feeling good and staying positive. Uh, I know these are crazy times right now, but uh, just take care of yourself and your families. And I'm thinking about you. And again, let me know uh, via email if you need anything. All right. Uh, any other updates, I'll be throwing into Google Classroom. And aside from that, have a wonderful, beautiful day. Peace.